Warm up today. We are on the countdown toward the EOC, our end of course exam. So just wanted to go back and do a little bit of spiral review of some uh, linear equations. These would be inactive calculator problems. Let's see how we do. All right. Um, all three of these questions today are going to revolve around the following graph. So let's take a second and look at the graph. It is titled Money Earning from Babysitting. And we can see the x-axis is our babysitting time and hours and how much money um, is earned. So obviously as the time you spend babysitting increases, so does the money earned, um, which makes this a uh, positive correlation. So let's see what the first question is asking. Which of the following equations best models the data? babysitting and money earned. So I've got four linear equations here, all in the form of y equals mx plus b, meaning I can pick out the slope. Um, for example, in choice b, the slope would be 6 fifths, and the y-intercept would be 2. Um, so just by looking at my scatter plot, um, I can kind of sketch a line of best fit, right? where I think it goes, maybe something like that, trying to keep the data or the dots equally dispersed on either side of my line of best fit. Um, you know, and I guess I could just hope then that that is, you know, close to one of the options. Um, you know, but hmm, maybe this might be a better one. No, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to see. So in scenarios like this, often what I do, when I'm not real sure, because some of the, honestly, these choices are kind of close together, right? The slope of the first choice uh, is one uh, with a y-intercept of zero, and the slope of this one is one and a fifth. I mean, that's not too far off, right? Visually, you're, that's gonna be hard to tell the difference in steepnesses. So maybe what I should do is just like take choice A and graph it. For example, y equals x, right? I know that that y-intercept would be zero, and my slope would be one. So I could just very quickly, you know, put a dot at zero and then go up one over one. Looking pretty good. Up one over one, up one over one, up one over one, up one over one. Oh my. But now, upon closer inspection, this would be the line y equals x. I'm definitely not going to use that as my line of best fit, right? That's way um, too far slanted or, you know, the steepness is not good enough. No, not good. Not good, good, good. So I'm going to mark that one out, right? Maybe I take choice B and do the same thing. Y-intercept of two, and then a slope of six fifths. So my, I would go up six over five and do that a couple times and see what that looks like. So from two, go one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, uh oh, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Something like that. Oh, what do you think about that one? I kind of like that one. I'm going to save that one. All right? So slope intercept two. Sorry. Slope of six fifths, y intercept of two. I kind of like that one. Let's try these other ones just to be sure. Y intercept of four on the next one. That seems a little high to me. And then up three over two. One, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. That's going to look like that. I'm not picking that one. Bad. All right. And let's look at the last one. Y-intercept of four again. But this time the slope is one-fourth, right? Up one over four. Let's we'll see. Up one, one, two, three. Oh, that's way too flat. No, 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 no. Definitely choice B. Okay. So this is the equation right here. Of all the options they've given me, that's definitely the one that best models the data because um, from all my other data points, right, uh, even though I've got a few that are a little far away, right, like look at this baby out here. She's kind of far away, but, you know, it's kind of offset kind of by that one a little bit. So then I've got some that are dead on, right, that are really, really close. All right, uh, number two, estimate the correlation coefficient, or the correlation coefficient is how, the closer those dots, the points, the raw data is to our line of best fit that models the data, um, the closer our R value is to one. Remember the R value 
is less or equal to one, one being perfectly linear, positive, and then negative one being perfectly linear, negative. Um, it's definitely positive, it's pretty close, right? I mean, I don't know, 0.8, what do you think? Is that close enough? I mean, it's, yeah, 0.8, I would say, approximately. All right, because that's a pretty good fit. Not, not too shabby, if I do say so. All right, and then which point do you believe has the largest residual? Remember that residual is the difference between a point and the line. And uh, it's funny how I talked earlier about how this point right here is kind of far away. Well, that means that that has a very high residual compared to, let's say, this point here. So this point, whatever that point is, let's see, that is 4 comma 12. I definitely believe that point has the largest residual. Now, I could actually figure out what that residual is. Remember what the residual, oops, I did that wrong, Miss Felix. The residual would be from this point to where it, the at same x values, this would be the residual. Woo, pay attention, Miss Felix. Yeah, it's how far it is when you have the same x value. So, for example, um, the raw data says when x is 4, y is 12. But if I were to take my equation and put 4 in for x and see what it predicts out for y, I'm probably not going to get something, I'm going to get something less than y, I mean less than 12, that's for sure, because this is on the line right here. Okay, And you can see that when x is 4 on the line, that y value looks to be around 7, where the raw data says it's around 12. So this is probably going to be approximately 7, would be my guess. Okay. So 24 fifths would be about 5. So seems about right. Okay. All right. So this point right here would have the largest residual because it's the furthest away from the line. All right, make sure you got those three on your warm-up paper for today. Now, what we're going to do next, put your warm-up paper away, is you should have received a um, test prep lesson two of one of your classmates, and we are going to check that right now. So if you want to pause the video, make sure everybody has a paper to check. And I'll switch my screens, and we will go to that task. Let's see, here we go. All right, remember you're checking it for right and wrong answers. I will be going back and looking at work and seeing if I need to adjust the score. Here we go. So calculator inactive. Um, I wanted you to figure out what the exponent on the x needed to be to make these two things equal. Remember this is calculator inactive. So I gave you a hint on my Canvas page and it was to rewrite, um, for example, if you have 2 to the x equals 2 to 8, obviously if these two things are equals, x would have to be equal to 8, right? So what you have to do in a scenario like this is make um, the, the bigger base, they're going to be set up so that you can rewrite that in the terms of the other base. So in other words, 16 is equivalent to 2 fourths. Okay, all I did is replace 16 with 2 fourths. And then uh, you still have your exponent of 5 on that. So then I just used my exponent rules, which is to multiply the exponents. And I realized that, well, that's just 2 to the 20th. So therefore, x must be 20. Okay. Uh, number 2 was a uh, sequence problem. They wanted you to come up with the recursive formula. And I, when I looked at my x values and my y values, I could see that as my x's were going up by 1, my y's were going up by 10. Uh, that made it a linear arithmetic sequence. And I just, if recursive just means explain the formula to somebody, well, the formula would be, well, how do I figure out this number here? Well, I've got to go get the previous term, right? Previous term would be a sub n minus 1 and add 10 to it, and that would give me the next term. So this would be the appropriate recursive formula, okay? Number three, perfect example of an EOC style question. So they give me, um, uh, tell me the equation of a line is one side of a parallelogram. First thing I did is I converted that into y equals so I could easily graph it. Okay, so when I did that, I got negative 2x plus 1. 
here's one, and then I used my slope and got other points on the line. So this was the line that they gave me. Now, they tell me that that represents one side of a parallelogram. The opposite side of a parallelogram, meaning on a parallelogram, right, opposite sides are parallel, right? Top and bottom would be parallel and the sides would be parallel. So uh, the opposite side had to go through the point four two, so I thought of the point four two. Well, I knew that if they're parallel lines, well, I don't know about the slopes, the slopes would have to be the same. So once I plotted the point four two, then I could go down, have the same slope down two over one, down two over one, and I could draw that line, but I need its equation. So I need its slope, which I know, but I need to know where it crosses the y, y axis. Now I could do that graphically, if I count very carefully my slope until I get up here to this point, or I could do it algebraically by putting four in for x, two in for y, keeping my slope negative two, and then just doing the algebra and solving for the y-intercept, and I see that that y-intercept is 10. Now, um, I had to go back though into standard form, all right, because what I had right now is this. I knew my slope and I knew my y-intercept was 10. But to go to standard, I had to move this x term over to the other side. Lucky for me, it was negative, so when I canceled it out here, it added a positive, and now it was in correct standard form, okay? So choice A is what we would want there, all right? Now you may say, well, I don't see a parallelogram. He's talking about parallelogram. Well, that's because they only were talking about two sides. There's, all, there's other sides, they just didn't talk about it. Maybe here and here. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Okay, they just wanted us to look at those two sides that they, that they uh, referred to there. All right, uh, number four, they give me um, an F function and a G function. The F function is linear, y equals m x plus b. The G function is exponential because I've got an exponent of x. And they just simply want me to uh, figure out for which value of x makes them equal. Oh, well, without a calculator, I'm just plugging and chugging. I start at zero, for heaven's sakes. Just put in some numbers. But don't put in a number like three fourths or negative 18. Start at zero. Probably going to be a fairly small number. So if I put in zero for the first one, I got out negative four. And if I put in a zero for my g function using my exponent of zero, I know that three to the zero is one, two minus, two gives me two minus six, eight. Oh, look at there, lucky me. Zero happened to be the x value that worked. Now, if it wasn't, and then I would try one. I'd put one in, and then I would try two. And then if I see the values getting further apart, then maybe I would try some negative numbers, okay? Um, but always, you know, if you're having to plug and chug, start at zero and go from there. All right, uh, number five. So without a calculator, um, and you're doing a, just an exponent problem like this, first thing you always want to do is, to simplify it, is move all your negative exponents so that they are positive. So I did that. Hey, Alex. Yes? You've got a student up here for, uh, he said he's supposed to be meeting with you. Yes, I've got several coming at 8. I'll be up there at 8. Okay, sounds good. Thank all right. Uh, all right, so... We're going to move these exponents so that they are positive. So I did that. This 3 to the negative fifth got moved to the bottom. This 2 to the negative fifth got moved to the bottom. The 2 to the negative fourth got moved to the top. And the 2 to the negative third got moved to the top. Okay? Now that everything's positive, what I'm going to do is find things that have like bases. Well, in the top, I had a 3 to the fifth by itself, so I just recopied that here. Right? But in the bottom, since I had three to the fifth and three to the second, I went ahead and combined those by adding their exponents, which gave me my three to the seventh in the bottom. Same thing with the bases of twos. In the top, I needed to combine these, which gave me my two to the seventh in the top, and I just recopied the two to the fifth in the bottom. Now, I'm gonna look for like bases um, top and bottom. So three to the fifth on the top, three to the seventh in the bottom, well, that's gonna give me two left over in the bottom, three to the second left in the bottom. So I put it there. And then with my twos, I'm gonna have two to the second left in the top. Because remember, you're subtracting exponents. But again, I don't really do that. I just say, if I got all these twos in the top, and I got all these twos on the bottom, cancel, 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 where are they left? Okay, that's all you really have to do. Um, and what I was left with here was four, we'll see two squared, which was four, over three squared, which is nine. So four ninths is the answer that we needed there. Okay. All right, um, let's look at the calculator active part. So for number six, uh, this was just factoring. However, they notice how they um, set this up. 
You couldn't just use your choices and foil them together because they only gave you one of the two factors, all right? So this is how they get around you, just uh, kind of manipulating the test and uh, checking your way through it, right? So they gave me this trinomial. If the x squared has a coefficient, it's not a GCF. So the only way I can factor this is to four terms. Stretch this trinomial out into four terms. So I needed factors of 12 that add to seven, which were three and four. So I kept my first term to x squared, kept my six on the end, and divided my 12 up to it into a four x and a three x. I did my nano nano, I grouped it, I took my GCF out of each group, and I was left with these two binomials, one of which needed to be one of the four options they gave me, and there was no x plus two as a choice, so that, but there was a two x plus three, so that was the answer we needed. Okay, number seven. Um, this was just a sequence problem. Now it's written a little differently, but they just wanted you to see that in the first term of my sequence is four, the second term of my sequence is nine, 14, and so forth. Um, you can see that the pattern looks like we're adding five every time, which makes it an arithmetic sequence. So D is automatically out because it has an exponent. Um, all the other options are linear. Um, so I could write it recursively and then put it in um, exponent, or I could just go straight to the uh, explicit formula, which would be a sub n equals a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times D which would look like a sub n equals my first term is four, plus n minus one times my common difference of five. I could distribute, combine my terms, and you're gonna get five n minus one. But remember when we did this, the, whenever they write it as y equals mx plus b, which is what this is, um, that five right there is not the first term. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. That five right there is not the first term. You're right. It is my, uh, it's your slope. That's your constant adding pattern, which we know is plus five. But the B, the y-intercept, notice is not four because the B, remember, is that fake zero term, which if I go backwards in this problem five, my uh, little fake zero term would be negative one, okay? And then what I did here is I just showed by guessing and checking. Put in one, I got out four. If I put in two, I got out nine. So you could do this by, you know, do it by plugging and chugging if all else fails, okay? All right, number eight. Since this is calculator active, what you needed to do is just graph negative three x squared plus five. You're gonna get one of those parabolas that we talked about on uh, very briefly on Friday. And uh, it's gonna look something like this. Now, you already know what range means. It's all the y values. Well, when you look at this um, parabola that is graphed, the highest value right here is, I don't know what the x value is, but the y value is five, which means all the points on this parabola, the y value it has to be five or less because they're all going downward, okay? So A is the choice you would want there. That would describe all the correct y values of that graph. Okay. Number nine, write the equation of a line that passes through four negative 16 and is perpendicular to negative two thirds x plus eight. Well, they were nice because the original equation is already in mx plus b form. So I know that the given slope is negative two thirds. So if my line is perpendicular, I want the opposite reciprocal slope of positive three halves. So I could just go and uh, find my choice that has a, a slope of three halves, positive. Oh, but there's three choice, A doesn't. But this one has three halves, this one has three halves, and so does this one. So on this one, you have to go find the y-intercept. And remember to do that, you have to do some algebra. I have to take the given point, four, negative 16, substitute four in for x, negative 16 in for y. I did that right here and did my math and figured out that the y-intercept I need is a negative 22, which is gonna match choice C, okay? And the last one. Now, this uh, technically, there's a different way to solve this problem. Um, which we're going to get into later um, this week or next week. But for right now, your hint was to just plug in the R values. Um, the question is asking you to figure, you got the cylinders filling up with water. They're asking you to figure out the radius of the tank. Well, the R value is like all your X's. So they're all my answers in this problem. So I just need to figure out what number I can put in place of R that makes this equal 1,200. Just plug and chug on your answer choices for this one, right? Um, I would not plug in 18 and 2 11ths, choice A, unless I absolutely had to. 
So I would maybe try the 30 first. If that doesn't work, then I would try the 10. And if all else fails, I would try the two mixed numbers uh, that they gave me. But lucky for me, 10 worked because when I substituted 10 in for R and squared it, and then I put 10 in for this R right here, multiplied it by the um, six, everything worked out. So I know that it must be a 60 R. Everything works out to give me 1200 when I do put 10 in place of the R value, okay? So that makes C the choice there. All right, that was very, very fast, but you need to go back to the top of the paper and tell me how many of the 10 they got correct and give it back to whom it belongs, all right? So let's get that taken care of right now.